We're going to go through the basics of a Grignard reaction. We're going to go through different types of reactions. And with each one, we're going to look at shortcuts for how to recognize them in synthesis. And if you want additional problems, I will have a worksheet for you at .com slash orgolive. It's also in the pinned comments. Go right back to the basics. What is a Grignard? First of all, Grignard is spelled like this, but it is pronounced as if with a Y, Grignard. A Grignard is an organometallic that has the format of R, M, G, and X, where R can be any R group, so carbon with anything. So for example, you can have a Grignard where the R group is a CH3, M, G, X. You can have something with a pi bond, for example, this group right here with an MGX, you can even have a benzene ring. It doesn't matter what it is. If the R group is attached to the MGX, that right there is your Grignard, and they will all follow the same reaction regardless of what it is. The key behind this, what makes a Grignard so useful and so reactive is if you look at what is on the Grignard, you have a metal. Metals are very, very low in electronegativity. Think of them almost like really positive or partially positive in nature. Putting a halogen onto the metal means that this negative is pulling whatever little negativity that magnesium would have had otherwise, making this entire thing so positive that by comparison, carbon is extremely negative. And that includes the electrons that bind carbon to the Grignard making the R group act as if it was a carbanion. Carbanions, as you hopefully know, are very, very reactive. What is a carbanion? Well, we have carbon, an negative, and ion, something with a charge because it gained or lost electrons, in this case, a carbon with a negative charge. If you have a carbon with a negative charge, just a quick review of the basics. What you're looking at is a carbon with three bonds, a lone pair sitting in that p orbital. This right here is very, very reactive because carbon, let me just write the word reactive. Carbon, unlike nitrogen or oxygen, the elements that have higher electronegativity and therefore like that positive charge, uh, I'm sorry, like that negative charge, even though they'll attack something, they can hold it. Carbon is so much less in electronegativity. It does not like those negative charges, and it will do a very, very strong attack by comparison to anything else. And this is what we're going to be looking at with the Grignard reactions. And I see in the comments, Beryl did this last week. Alaha is very excited learning about it again last week. Bailey started learning it today, excited and nervous. Well, Bailey, after today, hopefully it's going to be a lot more excited and a lot less nervous because we're going to cover all the basics and then some tricks. So let's take a look at how to form a Grignard. And we're not going to look at the exact mechanism, mostly because it's not really known. It's more understood about what happens. Say I have a molecule, let's go very, very simple, a CH3 bound to a halogen like bromine. If I react this in special conditions with magnesium in something like an ether, the key with the solvent is it has to be an aprotic solvent. If you remember from SN2 reactions, aprotic solvent means that there is no proton sitting on an oxygen or a nitrogen. The solvent is going to be mostly nonpolar or very low polarity, nothing too reactive. What will happen is the magnesium is going to insert itself between the carbon and the halogen so that you get a CH3 bound to the Mg, bound to the bromine. And because of the difference in electronegativity, very partially positive, very partially negative, carbon with these electrons is now an attacking machine. This is the key. Everything else is based on understanding exactly what is going on here. So let me know in the comments if this is clear. And then we'll look at the very, very basic Grignard mechanism. They're pretty much going to follow this concept. If I have a carbonyl 
which you should recognize that even though the carbonyl is neutral, because of the potential for resonance between carbon and oxygen, the carbon is very partially positive and oxygen is very partially negative. If I bring in a Grignard like the one we just showed, a CH3 MGBR, this very, very negative carbon, as if a carbanion electrons, the electrons specifically binding it to the magnesium, are going to reach for this partially positive carbon. Assuming this carbon had the correct number of bonds, the pi bond is going to get broken and kicked up onto oxygen because otherwise carbon would have had too many bonds. And to show you, I'm just going to put two quick R groups. Now it has a complete octet. This is where we want to pay attention. What we have is the purple carbon, the oxygen, two initial lone pairs, and the extra light blue lone pairs that came from the pi bond being broken. Oxygen now has a negative charge. We have the two R groups that I showed in gray. And now, attached to carbon, we have a brand new bond, the C to C the one that came in an attack on the original carbon. This is why Grignards are so, so critical in synthesis because Grignards will give us a new carbon to carbon bond. In other words, this is a great reaction for chain elongation. The MGBR is a spectator in solution. Some professors will show it hanging around like this as a positive MGBR next to the O minus. I'm showing this to you now, but for the remainder of this session, I am going to ignore that because it just dissipates off, so, just floats away somewhere in solution. So let me know in the comments. Do you agree? We understand that MGBR can hang around. It goes off somewhere in solution and we don't really care about it anymore. Then all we have to do is neutralize the molecule. Typically, this is done with a mild acid. So if we bring in H3O plus or H2O, I've seen both of them being used. The oxygen will reach for the hydrogen, give oxygen, that oxygen back its electrons. And our final product in this case is the purple oxygen now bound to the blue hydrogen and everything else is still there. So we have the two R groups. We have that incoming CH3. And where we had a carbonyl, now we have an alcohol. If you're with me so far, let me know in the comments. And while you do, here is what you want to recognize what happened. The two things that happened is one, the carbon chain grew, meaning we had a chain elongation. And two, your carbonyl turned into an alcohol. I want you to recognize it and I want you to look for this in all of the upcoming reactions. I put this as an H2O, but I'm thinking a lot of your professors will probably show this as an H3O plus. So the only difference is one lone pair, an extra hydrogen, a positive charge on the oxygen, and everything else is exactly the same. We have water off somewhere in solution. One thing I want to point out, I showed you the Grignard in the first step, an acid catalyst in the second step, make sure you show that it's step one and step two, that they're not happening at the same time. Because if you were to dissolve Grignard in water, the Grignard or in acid, the Grignard will attack the solution, get destroyed, no more Grignard. So make sure you show it as a separate step. All right, so let's go and look at a bunch of Grignard reactions. I'm gonna show you the long way and then the short way for each one. And I want you to pay very close attention to the pattern. I want you to look for what I showed you before. If I have the smallest carbonyl carbon chain that I can think of, it's methanol, an aldehyde on both sides. Okay, and this is key to recognize the pattern. So this is the smallest aldehyde. It has no other carbon chain. And if I react this in two steps, where step one, let's go with this Grignard, an isopropyl Grignard. And step two, we'll put H3O plus. Again, step two, so that the Grignard doesn't attack it. What'll happen, this bond right here is the one we're looking at. So always show your arrow coming from there. 
it attacks the carbonyl, kicks up the pi bonds. Now, I'm not going to show this step by step because in a question like this, you want to go straight to the product. So I'll show it to you one, two, but then I'll show it to you just as one. We have our blue carbon with now only one oxygen. I didn't show any of the lone pairs, but it does have a negative charge. We have the two hydrogen atoms that it had to begin with. And now it has that isopropyl group attached. This would have been a negative charge, but then in the next step, we add a hydrogen. We protonate it to give me a final product. And this is what I meant by I showed it to you in two pieces, but ultimately I'm going straight for the final alcohol. And that is my final product. Now here I showed it to you with the mechanism. First thing I want to do is redraw it so you can see the full thing in line structure. So that is just this right here. Okay, so notice that this carbon is right there, but I'm not drawing it because I'm showing you a line structure. And I'm also not showing the two hydrogens. If this is clear, then here is what I want you to consider. The shortcut, the quick way for coming up with this product without the mechanism is simply to look at the carbonyl that you started with. So let's draw it again and mark it up. If I had methanol that looked like this, I identify the carbonyl, recognize that it's about to get attacked with a Grignard, and so all I do is break the pi bond, add a hydrogen, and then add whatever R group I have on the Grignard. So if, drawing the same thing again, my Grignard has an MGBR on an isopropyl group, all I do here is add in that isopropyl group. Let me know in the comments, does this shortcut make sense? Step one, you want to break the pi between C to O, and you want to turn the O into an alcohol. And step two, you just add the R group to the carbon of the carbonyl. This is it. This is how we are going to do most of the reactions from today. Well, let's see how that looks. In this case, the car the chain is just one carbon. And so I'm just going to draw it as a blue dot. I'm going to show the red as the new bond. This is my incoming Grignard. And then the blue carbonyl turned into an alcohol. That is the entire thing put together. And what I want you to recognize here, in addition to the shortcut, here's is that the pattern is as follows. If I have just one carbon and nothing else, I get a primary alcohol because all I did was grow the chain in one direction. Now, if I got a primary alcohol here, adding one carbon to a primary alcohol would give me a secondary alcohol. So let's see how that pattern makes sense, how it plays out. And Nick says, it's so much better with the different colors like that. So Nick, I share this often. I have ADHD. And if I was learning something like this, and it was done in typical professor fashion, like that. If I was a student, I would lose my mind. It is very, very difficult to follow. And this is coming from me, the teacher. So if I'm lost here, I'm going to guess that students are lost too. This is why I do everything in color, because with ADHD, it's very critical for me to have everything stand out. I want the separate pieces to show me where they came from, where they're going, what they're doing. I feel that it brings everything to life and just makes everything more understandable. So let's now take that methanol and go one degree up in terms of the substitution. So let's make it slightly bigger. What is a carbon chain on methanol? Well, it'll just be an aldehyde. An aldehyde is a carbonyl on the end of a chain, but the chain is a little longer. So look what happens. If I made the chain a little bit longer and I have an aldehyde, I'm going to react it with the same exact Grignard MGBR in step one, step two, H3O plus. And this could be another halogen too, Cl iodine, but why not? The shortcut that I showed you before applies exactly the same way. So I wrote it out here. Break the pi bond of the carbonyl. So we'll do that right here. 
turn the oxygen into an alcohol. We'll do that right here. And then add the R group to the carbon of the carbonyl. So in this case, because I have an R group here, I'm just going to add it to the other side. So I'll add it here like that. This is me marking it up over here, but I'll show you how to come up with it with a, in the product directly if you don't want to do this. Redraw the carbon skeleton. So this is another version of this if you want to go straight to the product. Redraw the carbon skeleton, but your carbonyl only draws an oxygen because we broke the pi bond and turned it into an alcohol. So I just have the oxygen with a hydrogen. And then I have a new bond coming out of the carbonyl, and I add whatever was on my Grignard right there. And that is the product. Starting with an aldehyde, notice that I got a secondary alcohol. Do you see how that's one up from the primary alcohol that we had here? Because this is one up, meaning it has one more carbon chain than the methanol that we started with. Nick says, I would lose my mind too. Yep. Well, here we are not losing our minds learning Grignards together. So let's continue. What if I add another R group onto the starting molecule? What is an aldehyde with one more R group added onto it? If I take the aldehyde, the carbonyl, and then I add one more R group on the other side, I get a ketone. If I have a ketone, think about it. I added one more R group. From the aldehyde, I got a secondary alcohol. What should be my product if I have one more R group? Let's see. Step one, we'll add the same Grignard. Step two, we'll react it with H3O plus. And this time, I'm going to go straight to drawing the product without even marking up the reactant. And I challenge you to see if you can do all of this with me. Okay, so let's see. I have my carbon skeleton, which I'm going to squish together a little bit. So instead of drawing it like that, I'm drawing it like this. But it's the same two, uh, the same three carbons that I had on the parent. I have my oxygen, which I will turn into an alcohol. Out of that former carbonyl carbon, I have a new bond. And then I add whatever I saw on the Grignard right there. Eggy Pasta Yum says tertiary alcohol. And that is absolutely correct. Because look at what we have here. Why do I keep getting the wrong color? I have a carbon with three groups coming out of it. In fact, if you're not comfortable with my pencil trick, this is something I teach to help you quickly recognize that it is primary, secondary, or tertiary. Put your highlighter or pencil or pen, whatever you're using, on the carbon holding oxygen, and then see how many lines come out of that carbon to other carbons. Notice that three lines came out of that carbon to other carbons. That is how I know I have a tertiary alcohol, and that is correct. Question. Why is added on the right and not the left? Ah, that is a very, very good question. So let's change this up for a moment. I'm going to answer your question with a practice problem. Let's do another ketone. And this time, I'm going to keep it very simple, reacting it with a CH3 MGBR. Step one, step two, H3O plus. Notice that if I do the trick, I redraw my carbon chain. I have an O, I have an H, new bond to a methyl, so I'll just draw it out like that as one line. In this case, I have three CH3 groups. This thing has absolutely no stereochemistry, no chirality whatsoever. And so in this case, where I added it, right, left, top, bottom, absolutely irrelevant, it doesn't matter. But what if I change it up? What if this time I start with an asymmetrical ketone? And I react it with something that is not going to be similar. So let's go. I seem to be going a lot with the isopropyl today because it's simple 
but it's also not too simple. So it'll give us a unique substituent. And this time I'm going to change this side to purple. So we have the purple carbon, the OH, the blue chain is an ethyl, and the new one is the isopropyl. Notice that in this case, I have a chiral carbon. I recognize that it's chiral because it has four unique substituents. And so the question is, do I get R or do I get S? Well, the answer is yes. Yes, I get R. Yes, I get S. This chiral carbon is going to show up in both forms. I'm going to get a racemic product. The racemic product, meaning I get R and S, about 50-50 each, happens because the starting molecule gets attacked at the carbonyl carbon. This is sp2, and if you remember, an sp2 hybridized carbon is trigonal planar, aka flat, and something flat can get attacked from the top or the bottom, giving me two potential stereoisomers if the product is Chiral. If it's achiral like this one, it's one product and it absolutely does not matter. Eggy pasta, that was, uh, sorry, Bela, that was a really good question. Let me know if that is clear. And for anyone else wondering, do you see why if chiral, I get a racemic product, which didn't actually answer Bailey's question. So let's go back here. Did it matter if I added it from the right, the left, the top or the bottom? No, because the carbon holding the oxygen has two methyl groups, making it achiral, meaning it actually didn't matter what I added where. I added it to the right side just because I was trying to keep with the pattern and making sure that you follow. But I gave you the long explanation because in case you do come up with something chiral, you know how to address it. Excellent. Okay, so we did the basics for what you're going to see, the easy questions that are going to come up in synthesis. And so I want to draw them all out again really quick because I want to show you another trick for them. We started with methanol. You know what? Before I do that, I actually want to show you one more. This is technically not an aldehyde ketone type carbonyl, but isn't this just as well a carbonyl? Carbon dioxide has a carbonyl at the top and a carbonyl out on the bottom. Carbon dioxide as a gas is very, very useful in synthesis where you're trying to create the functional group that I'm about to show you and you want to grow your molecule by one carbon. So if you want to grow the chain by one carbon, this right here is the go-to. I want you to recognize this. Let's use, uh, let's go with something different. So we'll do this right here with MgCl in step one. Step two. H3O plus. Notice that the same exact trick applies that I did before. I break one of the pi bonds, except this time it's not just an alcohol. I have a whole other carbonyl to deal with. And so I'll start with that. I have the whole other carbonyl to deal with. And then I have an O and an H. So notice that carbon is that carbon. And the mechanism will probably help so you could see what happened. I'll show it attacking from this way so you could see how I'm growing my chain. That right there is my new bond. And I have one, two, three former carbon. So one, two, three. Notice that my final product is a four carbon carboxylic acid. If you have to synthesize a carboxylic acid or derivative that is one carbon longer then whatever it is you're starting with, this is your go-to. So let me show it to you in something closer to what you're going to see in synthesis. Say you have a molecule that, uh, let's make it fun because professors like to trick you. You have something like this and somehow, some way, you have to synthesize a molecule. Let me make this look a bit better. I don't even remember how many carbons I had on it because I just made it up. So we'll do it again. We'll do it like that. And somehow, some way, you have to synthesize a molecule that looks like this. When I teach synthesis, I teach you not to just look at the molecule and start reacting, but actually to ask two questions. Question number one, what is the same? 
And question number two, what is different in study hall members? We have quite a bit of synthesis for you to review. If you're not a member yet, I'll talk about the study hall at the end. But if you're curious, the link is there. And so what we're looking at here is what is the same and what is different? What's the same is this part of the carbon chain right here. That is the same and it has an alcohol. What is different is that I have one more carbon being added and I turn it into a carboxylic acid. So what do I have to do here? I have to add plus one carbon and I somehow have to turn an oxygen into a carboxylic acid. Now this is where students tend to panic. They go, okay, I know that I can turn an oxygen into a carboxylic acid by oxidizing it with something strong like a Jones reagent or something in the chromic acid family. But how do I get that other carbon in there? As soon as you see an extra carbon carboxylic acid, your first thought should be, hey, that came from carbon dioxide and a Grignard. So one step back, I had car uh, carbon dioxide. So step one, I added, well, I have to turn this. I had to have a Grignard right there. And once I had the Grignard, I was able to add carbon dioxide to it in step one. And step two would have been H3O+. What would a Grignard look like without this? And here's what you want to do. You say, okay, that right there came from a carboxylic acid. This was CO2. And then this right here was a Grignard. I want you to pay very close attention to how I broke this up. This was my new bond. This was a Grignard and it attacked a carbon dioxide. So what would that look like as a Grignard? Let's fill this in. Well, it's just my purple chain and nothing else. So I'll do exactly what I have over here, the purple part of the molecule, and I'll put a Grignard on it. So we'll put MgCl, which brings me to a new synthesis. Notice I wasn't worried about how to go from here to here. I only thought one step back. And now I can ask myself, how do I turn an alcohol into a Grignard? I don't know how to turn an alcohol into a Grignard, partly because I know that you don't turn an alcohol into a Grignard. But I do know that if I had a Grignard, then it had to come from, and I think that should be a bromine because chlorine is not as good on a terminal carbon. So that would be just a bromine. And that brings me... Actually, with that reaction, it didn't matter because there are a couple of reagents that do that. So disregard what I said there. This will work as well. I was thinking of turning it into an alkene, but I actually thought of a faster way as I'm talking. I can turn the alcohol into a chlorine, chlorine into a Grignard. Grignard reacts with carbon dioxide, and boom, I get my final product. So let me know what you think of this synthesis as I start filling in the reagents. If I have an alcohol and I want to replace it at the primary position, I have to be very, very careful not to allow for side reactions. I'm going to use something like SOCl2 in pyridine. You could have also used a tosyl chloride if you wanted bromine, which would work just as well. Use something like PBr3. And that gives me the chlorine. I simply react it with magnesium in ether. So let's give a specific one because your professor may not accept ether. ET2O diethyl ether. THF is another common one. Once I have the Grignard, I react it with the carbon dioxide and water as two separate steps. And that is my final product. Question. Wouldn't rearrangement occur and instead react as a secondary carbocation? Yes, that is why I chose the bribe alcohol direction rather than turning it into a carbocation. If I had an alcohol here, then I know the carbocation isn't going anywhere. But if I tried to put a carbocation here, I get rearrangement. Definitely no primary carbocation. Using something like an SOCL2 that will bribe the alcohol, that will hold on to it and get kicked out rather than it leaving and forming a carbocation ensures no rearrangement. Really good question. How do you know CO2? This is exactly what I'm showing you here. This reaction is the best and simplest way to A, 
add a carbon onto your chain and B, turn it into a carboxylic acid. And so as soon as you recognize one carbon added to the chain and a carboxylic acid, this is the, there are other ways to do it, but this, in my opinion, is the best and fastest, I don't know how much it costs in lab, I'm talking about pen and paper chemistry, best and fastest way to do it. All right, so now that we have the CO2, let's take a look at the reactions together again, because I want you to look at the patterns. Um, we're not going to do CO2 because I want to specifically focus on the alcohols, but I figured that was a good one to show you. If I have just the methanol, we said that we're going to form, we'll use a very simple Grignard for this because I want to do this as a quick pattern. The product is going to be, well, in this case, it's just a two carbon chain. The blue is the one we added. And then, you know what? Let me do an ethyl so I can do it in line structure for the products. I feel like it's very important to nitpick a bit here just so you can very carefully see what we did. So we have two carbons. Let me draw this some bigger. Okay, so the two blue carbons that we added from the Grignard new bond and the green carbon is an alcohol. If I added one to it for an aldehyde, react it with the same thing and just assume H3O plus as step two, MGBR, step two, H3O plus, that just saves us some time. Then we have our two carbon chain, new bond, and this time I have the two green carbons that I started with, also an alcohol. Okay, I want you to pay very close attention to the pattern. If I do this with a ketone, and we'll do asymmetrical in this case, reacting it with the same set of conditions, I have the two blue carbons that added, the bond to what was there. And in this case, I have four carbons, one, two, three, four, like that, with an O and an H. Okay, so again, the pattern that we covered before. Methanol, one, uh, one carbon with nothing, no R groups on the side. Aldehyde, carbonyl R group on one side. Ketone, carbonyl R groups on both sides. I get a primary OH, here. A primary OH, a secondary OH, and a tertiary OH. Does it help to see it written out like this side by side with the color especially? And the reason I put that pot, that new bond in color is because I want you to be able to reverse this as well. So here is what you want to recognize. You're on an exam or a quiz. You see that you have to form this thing. You remember I said, hey, that should come from a Grignard, but you're trying to think, okay, how do I do it? Here is how you're going to reverse it. First, you identify where that carbonyl is. That carbonyl carbon, or that alcohol came from a carbonyl carbon. And so what you want to do is break that bond. After you break that bond, you know that this came from a carbonyl, and whatever's added was a Grignard. And now you're off to the races. Your synthesis just fell into place. Do you agree? Do you feel, and if you're watching the recording, also let me know in the comments, do you feel like this approach can help you instantly identify what happened? You're looking at a secondary alcohol. You recognize that this was your carbonyl carbon. This right here used to be a carbonyl, and that hydrogen wasn't there. Now you have two options. This could have come from two different Grignards. This right here could have been a Grignard, making that your aldehyde, or it could have also come from this, oh, sorry, this one right here could have been a Grignard, and that right there was your aldehyde. Do you see how I could have had two different options here? And if I have the tertiary, then this is even more so. Carbonyl carbon. That means you just put the pi bond there, get rid of that. 
any of the incoming R groups could have been your Grignard, except I have an ethyl and an ethyl. So in this case, um, we only have two options. But had it been, you know what? Let's not give us only two options. Let's say that this was a longer carbon chain. Now it's not two ethyls. Now I have a much longer chain on the other side. Look at what I could have had here. I could have had a methyl Grignard with the rest of this being a ketone. I could have had an ethyl Grignard with the rest of this being a ketone. And I could have had a propyl Grignard where the rest of this was a ketone. I feel like we're going to have to draw that one out just to show you. And so let's do that. I just, I want to make sure that you're crystal clear on this trick because this is going to save you a lot of frustration on your exam. So what I'm looking at is this right here. I'm going to show each of the bonds in red to that carbon with the OH. Uh, you know what? Let's just keep each one its own color so you can see where it came from. So I have the blue. I have the green. And I'll make this one purple like that. And we'll show the alcohol in a different color because that's not being added. Okay, so let me show you the different starting molecules that could have led to this combination. If the green one was a Grignard, then the starting molecule would have been like this. Right, there's my ketone. And my Grignard is just a CH3 MGBR. If my blue was a Grignard, my starting molecule would have been, and I'm rotating the green just so it looks right, a ketone, and react it with, uh, what did they say, blue, so that's an ethyl MGBR. If my Grignard was, I did the green, I did the blue, so the purple, that means my starting molecule would have been, I have the blue, and this time I'm twisting the green to this side, it's the easiest one to move. And I react it with one, two, three, and a Grignard, MG, BR. Each one has a second step as an H3O plus, Look at that. What do you think? Do you feel comfortable now that I've proven it to you, breaking it down into any of the starting molecules with a Grignard to get that product? Brad, typically in undergraduate synthesis, which is where this lecture is focused, we're not dealing with glucose. So I'm not sure exactly how to answer that question. Um, Glucose has so many OHs that the Grignard wouldn't even work. It would immediately get destroyed, just pluck one of the hydrogens off. So I'm not sure what specific reaction you have in mind. Sorry, can't answer that. All right, what happens if I try and, oh, I didn't put any products here because the product is this. In each case, you get the same exact product, but I'm showing you th three different combinations to come up with it. We talked mostly carbonyls with aldehydes and ketones. What happens if I try to react a Grignard with a carboxylic acid? And I know quite a few students have already started on carboxylic acids and derivatives, so you should maybe know the answer. If I bring a CH3 MGI into the system as step one, step two H3O plus, how will the Grignard attack the carboxylic acid? If you're not sure, I want you to think about what I told you regarding a Grignard and the solvent. A Grignard will go for the easiest thing to attack. And in a carboxylic acid, I have one option. Squeeze my way in with all this hindrance going on to a carbonyl carbon that is kind of sort of partially positive. Or I can just go for that acidic hydrogen, which is so ready to come off. 
Remember, this is like a carbanion. It's going for the easy to grab hydrogen. My intermediate will be a carboxylate, O minus. That CH3 is off somewhere in solution, bubbling out of a solution, because look at that, it turned into a gas, methane gas, and the Grignard is destroyed. H3O plus is just going to reprotonate the carboxylic acid. And so my final product is Grignard gone, useless. A carboxylic acid will not react properly with the Grignard, and so that won't happen. What will properly react with the carboxyl uh, with the Grignard, though, are carboxylic acid derivatives, and these have a very unique way of reacting. A carboxylic acid derivative is something that could have come from a carboxylic acid where the carboxy group was replaced by something else, for example, a chlorine. If I bring in a CH3 Grignard, and that carbon is going to attack at the carboxy, it'll happen the same way. It'll kick it up, giving me an O minus. I didn't show these, so I'll show them right now. That extra lone pair negative comes from the pi bond having broken. Chlorine is still there, but now I have the methyl group as a, I show you just as a green line, having added to the chain. At this point, even though my next step would be to bring in acid to protonate, chlorine is a pretty good leaving group. And therefore, this will happen so fast. The electrons go back down and the chlorine gets kicked out, giving me a new product. I just made a ketone. But this ketone is not going to stay because I still have Grignard in solution. You can't control for it. And the Grignards are going to attack again because we know Grignards like to attack ketones. And this time, when the Grignard attacks the ketone, let's go this way, the oxygen once again got kicked up. So I have the two lone pairs. We'll add the red one with a negative charge. We already had a green methyl group. Now we have a second green methyl group. Now we have nothing to kick out. The electrons cannot come back down. And so the molecule will rate around until we add the H plus. So this will be step two, H3O plus. Now it gets protonated. And what I get for a carboxylic acid derivative is an alcohol, two methyl groups added, and I got a tertiary alcohol as my final product. Okay, so look at what happened here. A carboxylic acid derivative with a good leaving group is going to attack twice. It's not just the acid halide, that acyl chloride that I have here. You can also have the same thing happen with another derivative that has a good leaving group. Let's say I'm looking at an acid anhydride. Technically, that right there is my carbonyl to attack, and that's a good leaving group. Now, both of them can get attacked. This thing will just get slotted from every direction. They get attacked here and here and here and here. But for the sake of showing the product, you just show that it attacks twice. And so if I react this with, let's just do an MgCl like this in step one, step two, H3O+. Plus. All you have to show, and the same thing for the Grignard, uh, the Grignard with the acid halide, identify your leaving group, get rid of it, and then your parent chain is going to get attacked twice. So that parent chain is right here with an alcohol, and whatever was on your Grignard, once, twice. One more group is going to do the same thing, and that is an ester. If I have an ester, which is not an not an OH like we saw the carboxylic acid, that was no good with the Grignard. But if I have something like an OCH3, the Grignard is not going to get destroyed. And so if I take this thing and I react it with MGI, step one, step two, H3O plus, once again, identify your leaving group and get rid of it. Your parent chain was the two carbons, the O 
the carbonyl, just like before, we turn that into an OH. And this time we add two new bonds to it because the Grignard attacked twice. So the three that we're looking at, the acid halide, in this case an acyl chloride, the acid anhydride, and the ester all got attacked twice. And they all gave me the tertiary alcohol, which is really important to recognize because if you need a tertiary alcohol on your exam, look at this. Option one is to do what we did before. Use a ketone and attack it with a Grignard. If you have a ketone, I'm sorry, if you have a tertiary alcohol that has three unique groups, notice that I gave you a methyl, an ethyl, and a propyl. Now you cannot use a carboxylic acid derivative because you need three unique substituents, which means you need a ketone, any of these ketones with a Grignard attacking. But if your product can have two of the same, an easier way to set this up is just a carboxylic acid derivative with a Grignard attacking once. So looking at this, I could have done it this way, or I could have said this came from a ketone. Watch. I could have, let's just copy it over so in your notes it doesn't look like a mess. I could also have done it as follows. This right here was my carbonyl. Get rid of the hydrogen. Make this one a Grignard. And all of that could have been my, ket my, um, yeah, my ketone. And it'll work just as well. It's really a question of which one comes to mind first and which one do you feel like using. Question, why is Cl a good leaving group? So what we're looking at with a leaving group, and you're going to learn this in detail when you cover carboxylic acid derivatives. What you're looking at is if it gets kicked out, will it be stable on its own? Chlorine, when it gets kicked out, is a halogen with a negative charge on an electronegative atom. It's relatively stable. It's relatively good at holding that charge. And therefore, because it can be stable when it's kicked out, it allows itself to get kicked out. Same thing with the anhydride. This is a carboxylate. It's acetate. It has resonance. It'll stabilize that negative charge. And the OCH3 is less obvious, but in the presence of a Grignard solution, we're looking at something that is such a strong negative base-like molecule that... In the presence of a Grignard, you can kick out an OCH3 and still get that kind of product. Eggy Pasta, love your handle. Let me know if that is clear. And if anyone else was wondering that as well, let me know in the comments. Let's do one more pattern that is very, very different. But this is a very good trick to have in your synthesis arsenal. If you have to synthesize a molecule, Let's go with something that looks like this. And it has a bromine. And somehow, some way, you're asked to come up with a molecule that looks like this. How would you rank this? Easy, medium, or hard? As you're typing that in, I want you to think about the approach to synthesis. Question one, what is the same? Question two, what is different? What is the same? Just the benzene ring. What is different is everything else. Now we somehow, some way have to take that bromine, turn it into a longer chain, and then add the alcohol. And where I've seen students get the most confused is that we have to find a way to add two carbons and then a functional group on the end. But here is the pattern I want you to look for. If you can identify two carbons on your parent chain and number them one and two, where carbon one has an alcohol 
and carbon two has a carbon chain, this was a very, very easy reaction, Bailey. Yes, easy. This was a Grignard attacking an epoxide. And here is what I want you to look for. That OH came from an epoxide being attacked by a Grignard. Okay, so let's see. By first turning the bromine into a Grignard. Very easy. All I have to do is react it with magnesium in a solution of ether. Let's use THF tetrahydrofuran as cyclic ether. This will give me a magnesium inserting itself between the bromine and the carbon chain. And then I react it with an epoxide. If I had more things coming off it, that could just be on the epoxide itself. So I have my epoxide as step one. And step two, uh, actually, I'll show you step two separately. And epoxide, as you remember from way, way back in the day, is a very unstable molecule because you have sp3 atoms that would like to have a 109.5 bond angle forced into a triangle that has 180 degrees between them. So what, 60 degrees? It's very, very unstable, looking for any excuse to break open. And if you bring in a Grignard, that will very easily attack one of the carbons, break it open as follows. I now have the benzene ring, as I had it before. The new bond coming from the ring where the Grignard used to be attached to the epoxide. That's the two carbons, carbons one and two, one and two. And then the oxygen is still attached on the other side, now with a lone pair and a negative charge because I got these two electrons. And so all I do in the last step is protonate it. I bring in H plus from any mild acid in water. The alcohol, I'm sorry, the O minus will attack the proton. And that is how I get this pattern. So if you're seeing the alcohols, as I showed you earlier, where you can identify that that specific carbon got attacked, that's an option. For example, this right here could have been a Grignard attacking methanol. Or if you need to have your chain a little further away, because this only has the benzene ring, nothing else on it, an epoxide is another very easy, very straightforward way to approach this. All right, so hopefully, especially for the students who just started Grignards, I hope that A, you understand this topic. It's not just here's information whacking you over the head. I hope you actually understand and get it. And B, I hope that you're able to recognize all of the patterns that I showed you so that when these problems come up in synthesis, you don't have to think through the whole long mechanism. You can just look at it and say, oh, I see the pattern. I know where to break it. I know where to draw. Let's go back here. I know where to break it up, where to draw the Grignard, where to draw the carbonyl. And hopefully you get through this synthesis quickly and efficiently. And obviously ace your exam. Tim says, I never would have thought of an epoxide. There you go. Now you have another trick in your arsenal. Now, this is just one single topic that we covered within, within Organic Chemistry 2. But if you're looking for more help on all of Organic Chemistry 1 and 2, I have a lot of videos on my YouTube channel and live stream recordings that cover the basics. And then in my membership site, in the Orgo study hall, I have the more advanced videos as well as a tutoring and support community where you can join me and your fellow students to post questions, to post your wins, to post your frustrations, to basically not be alone as you're going through this class. If you would like that kind of support, there's a link in the description and it's also on the screen. Come join me at layerforsci.com slash join. The notes from tonight's session, as well as the practice worksheet, so you can go through additional problems and see, do you actually know and understand? Are you able to apply it? Make sure to sign up at layerforsci.com slash or go live. That's where you'll get the link to tonight's recording, the notes from tonight's session, and the practice worksheet. Study hall members, I can work through the worksheet with you. Any questions you have, if you need me to check your work, that is what the group is about. That is why we have that community. So make sure that you check it out.